Hello, friends, and welcome back. So good to be with you again. Been missing you. I think of you often, and I just wish we could maybe sit around a table, have some coffee or something, and just fellowship with one another. You know what? What we could do. If you're available, you live here in Cushing, come join us on Sunday morning. We would love to be with you. Uh, we meet at 1030 and people are important to us and you're important to us. So thanks for joining us today. I, I was doing some history research and looking at something and some of you may or may not be old enough to remember, but back in the 70s, around 73, we had what was called an oil crisis. Didn't feel like there was enough. And I remember uh, kind of, and it wasn't necessarily rationing, but you were limited on how much gas you could get. And our speed limit was 55 because it was believed that these things were going to save our country, save our world because of a gasoline shortage. <clears throat> and um, one of the things that was going on at that time because of this oil crisis, there were a couple of aviation teams that were set on the tarmac. They didn't get to fly. I'm talking about the Blue Angels and the Thunderbirds, the Blue Angels of the Navy and the Thunderbirds of the Air Force. These were beautiful flying machines, and they made air shows. And they made a difference. And, and I think as a kid, I kind of wanted to be one of the pilots of either the Thunderbirds or of the Blue Angels, but that was not going to work out for me. But I'm reminded of a story that happened. So they go through this oil crisis and they weren't allowed to fly. But all of a sudden, since the oil crisis is over, they could start flying again. And they were doing a lot of flying, working on their maneuvers, working on working together as a team, flying in formation. And then in 1982, in, in Nevada, there was a tragic, tragic thing that had happened. Here they are flying in formation. They make this loop and they're coming down. They're supposed to level out at about 100 feet. When the lead aircraft traveling at over 400 miles an hour impacts the ground and the other three um, T-38s, the Northrop uh, T-38s all hit the ground almost simultaneously, blowing up, spreading debris for over a, uh, over a square mile, and it was a terrible tragedy. And it all happened after the research and after studying the crash scene. It was believed that what happened was the lead airplane, the stabilizer, jammed and it would not allow the plane to pull out of the dive that, was, that it was in. And the other pilots, doing as they were trained, followed suit and crashed with the pilot. Tragic, tragic thing. Now, there are some believe that it was more than just the stabilizer or what caused the stabilizer to jam was with going from being in sort of a bondage where they couldn't fly to having all of this time to fly, they forgot to do one thing, to regularly check and maintain the airplanes. When the airplanes were on the ground because they couldn't fly, there was great times of going through and checking everything, making sure everything was okay. But then when there was so much freedom, they forgot about the basics. Tragedy happened. I feel that what God has been showing me this last week and may, causing me to look at is not to ignore some of the basics of our own life. And I want to take you through a series of events that are mentioned in Scripture. They all have a thread that goes through them, and I hope that maybe through this I can tie them all back together at the end. The main people in this uh, event that I want to talk about are Jesus and one of his followers, a man by the name of Peter. We believe in the, our church that the Bible is the inspired word of God and that it agrees with itself from cover to cover. And it's important that we understand that it is what God has written to us in love. I guess what we could say is this here is God's love letter to us. I believe we know who Jesus is. Otherwise, why do we exist? Jesus is the reason that we have church. Jesus is the reason we believe what we believe. Jesus is the subject, the center of our whole story. He's the son of God. He has always been. He will always be. Now, Peter, he's different. Who was Peter? Peter had a beginning and an end where Jesus has been on forever and ever. The Bible is divided into two parts. We have the Old Testament telling the story of the life of the world before from creation before Jesus was born on earth. 
Jesus was in the Old Testament. He's, he's mentioned, he's referred to, we see his hand at work in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, he appears. And these first four books of the New Testament, they're known as Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. They're written by followers, disciples of Jesus. What's a disciple? It's a follower of Jesus. And Jesus said by this, you all, all men will know you are my disciples if you love one another. So Jesus was about love. And each one of these four books, they differ. I mean, you, you don't, follow the same pattern, but you follow the same Jesus. And what one gives a lot of detail to, another may not. And and what one emphasizes, another may not. Or they may all agree, but we need those four to understand who Jesus was and his plan for us and what he's going to do in us and for us and through us. Peter uh, was a fisherman by trade. That's what he started out as. And when Jesus met him and when Jesus left him, he said the same thing. He said, follow me. And when he left, he says, you must follow me. So Peter becomes a follower of Jesus. He leaves his profession of, of fishing, which had been quite good for him. And he becomes a follower of Jesus. Peter never failed to follow, but he did stumble a few times along the way. You might say Peter was um, impulsive. When Jesus was arrested, Peter pulled a knife out or a sword out, and he cut off the ear of the servant of the high priest. After Jesus ascended into heaven, Peter went on to start the church and do a lot of great things for the church. He has written uh, a couple of books that are in the Bible called First and Second Peter. But I want us to follow a conversation that started with Jesus and Peter. And we find this conversation in Luke chapter 22, starting at verse 31. These are the words we read. Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you, Simon, that your faith may, be, may not fail. And when you have turned back, strengthen your brothers. But he replied, Lord, I am ready to go with you to prison and to death. Jesus answered, I tell you, Peter, before the rooster crows today, you will deny me three times that you know me. You will deny three times that you know me. A lot of times in our English language, when we see the word but, it cancels those things in front of it. So what we have here is Simon, Simon, Satan wants to sift you. Cancel that. I've overcome the world. I'm going to defeat him, but I have prayed for you. And I, I feel Jesus is saying, don't focus on the fact that Satan is going to sift you, but focus on the fact that I've prayed for you. And when you blow it, uh, when you get back on your feet, strengthen everybody else. And I think there's something going on between the lines that we may not see. And I want to show you that not right now, but in a moment. In this same chapter of Luke, Jesus goes and he prays for his disciples and he asks his disciples to pray with him. What do they do? They take a nap. Jesus is arrested in the garden. Jesus stands on trial. Peter is in the courtyard warming himself by a fire and the people start asking him, are you one of the disciples? Are you one of them? At three times, Peter says, nope, not me, nope, not me, nope, not me. And all of a sudden, the rooster crows. And in Luke 22, verse 61, Peter looks up into the courtroom. He sees Jesus. The Lord turned and looked straight at Peter, is what it says in Luke 22, 61. He saw him eye to eye. They looked at each other from across the room. The Bible says that Peter went out from there and wept bitterly. He blew it right there. And as you continue to follow the story of Jesus, Jesus is crucified. His body is laid into the tomb. Uh, and as we celebrated last Sunday, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, some of those in another passage uh, in Mark, it says that the one that came and spoke to them, it says, go and tell the disciples and Peter. Did you catch that? And Peter. One more passage of scripture in John 21. Jesus is dead. Peter has been to the tomb and now he's gone back to business as usual. He's fishing. Jesus shows up on the shore and he starts getting things ready for breakfast. Peter, Jesus yells out to the boat and says, hey, you catch anything? And then Jesus says, cast your nets on the other side. 
Listen to John 21, starting verse 7. It says, Then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. And as soon as Peter heard him say, It is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him, for he'd taken it off, and he jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat, towing the full net of fish, for they were not far from the shore, about a hundred yards. And when they landed, they saw the fire of burning coals. There were fish on it and some bread. But keep reading here. Go down to verse 15, 15. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of jo John, do you truly love me more than these? Yes, Lord, he said, you know that I love you. Feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you love truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. And the third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because he asked him a third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things and you know that I love you. Jesus said, feed my sheep. He goes on and he says, I tell you the truth. When you were younger, you dressed yourself and went where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hand and someone else will dress you and lead you where you do not want to go. Jesus said this to indicate the kind of death which Peter would, um, which Peter would glorify God. Then he said to him, follow me. Peter turned and saw that the disciple whom Jesus loved was following them. This is, was the one who had leaned back against Jesus at the supper and had said, Lord, who is going to betray you? When Peter saw him, he said, Lord, what about him? Jesus answered, if I want him to remain alive until I return, what is that to you? You must follow me. I, I think of that last part there when Peter is asking about this other disciple, Jesus said, hey, bud, you need to stay in your lane. And I think that's great advice, stay in your line, stay in your lane. Now, when I read these verses, I feel what God was showing me this past week was to notice something. Notice not once did Peter ever go up to Jesus and apologize for denying knowing him. Didn't, didn't attempt to, to apologize for his mess up. Nowhere in the Gospels do we read of Peter asking Jesus to forgive him. As well as when we read all of the Gospels, we never read of Jesus saying, Peter, I forgive you. But what we do see is something more powerful than words, and it is the forgiveness that comes from Jesus through his actions. I feel that when Jesus said to Peter that you're going to be sifted, and when he said, I'm going to pray for you and to strengthen everyone when you come back, I think Jesus was saying, I am forgiving you right now. Not when you ask, but when, and when Jesus asked him three times if he loved him, even though Jesus uh, said, uh, when Jesus said, do you love me? He said, do you unconditionally love me? And Peter replied, I love you like a brother. Jesus was already doing the forgiveness. He was doing the forgiveness all the way back when he said, you're going to blow it. You're going to mess up. In other words, I think that the word, the only word I can come up with for what Jesus did was pre-forgiveness or pre-forgiver. With, with Jesus, it didn't start with the conversation with Peter saying, uh, with Jesus saying to Peter, Simon, Simon, uh, Satan wants to sift you. It started way before that. It started all the way back in the beginning of the Bible, in the book of Genesis, with the fall of man. Because what God said to the serpent was, you're going to strike at his heel and he is going to crush your head. God was already making the way for us to be forgiven all the way back at the beginning, before we were ever born, before we ever knew what we were going to do. So uh, Jesus has got to say, I'm going to make a way of reconnecting so that with what I have created can be reconnected to my son and to me, because I know they're going to blow it, and I am setting it up to forgive them ahead of time. I'm setting it up that if they will confess their sin, if they will repent and go away from their sin, I will make things right between them and me. So when Peter looked up and he saw Jesus while he was on trial, and after he heard the rooster crowed, the Bible says he went out and he wept bitterly. He was so sorry for what he had done. Another follower of Jesus by the name of Paul. He wasn't a follower when Jesus was alive, but after Jesus, he was going around, and he was killing people that followed Jesus, believing in what he was doing was a favor for God. And God woke him up through a bright light, and Paul became one of the most influential people in uh, the church and within even history today. Paul wrote most of the New Testament. Paul wrote these words. 
For the kind of sorrow God wants us uh, to experience leads us away from sin and results in salvation. There's no regret for that kind of sorrow. But worldly sorrow, which lacks repentance, results in spiritual death. The idea of repentance is to lead us away from sin and into following Christ. It's in Christ. It's going with Christ's ways and not our own ways. I believe that the only way to be like Jesus, to have this pre-forgiveness in our lives, is first to understand that we have been forgiven by him. If we have asked and we have received him as our Savior, we have been forgiven because we've asked him to forgive us of all unrighteousness. You cannot be a forgiving person until you realize how much you have been forgiven of and you become grateful for this forgiveness. Jesus said, he who has been forgiven little loves little. But Take that passage, take those words again. Uh, who he who has been forgiven little loves little. He who has been forgiven much loves much. I believe that the only way to be like Jesus is to have that pre-forgiveness. When an individual becomes intimate with God the Father, through worship, through two-way communication called prayer. And as the Spirit of God begins to dwell richly within that individual, and they become Spirit-led, listening to what the Savior says and listening to what the Word says, they're able to walk like Jesus, offering forgiveness to people before they even ask. The activity of the Holy Spirit is so evident in their life because they are able to display love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control, which are all the fruit of the Spirit. In most houses, church buildings, businesses, there's a thing on the wall that makes a difference in out, throughout the house. It's called a thermostat. Thermostats create uh, uh, and control the temperature of the room. In some houses, if not side, you might have a thermometer. Thermometers react to the temperature of what's around them. One controls the temperature, the other reacts to the temperature. And I believe we are called to be more like a thermostat than we are a thermometer. A thermostat has wires connected to the back of it. And those wires are connected to a power source. Without the power source, it is really only a thermometer. Without a connection to Christ, you are going to act more like a thermometer than you are a thermostat. You and I are no different than Peter. Christ has warned us that just like he did Peter, Satan wants to sift you as wheat. I have prayed for you, and when you return, when you repent, go and strengthen the brothers. We are all going to have people who push our buttons. Sometimes we wonder if, as a thermostat, we are going to be able to control our reaction. But keep in mind, our reaction reveals our relationship with Jesus Christ. Our reaction reveals our relationship. I have heard a number of people tell me in their lifetime, well, I could never forgive them. Granted, what was done to you was wrong, totally wrong, but you have a choice. Forgive or allow them to eat your lunch. Forgiveness is given, trust is earned. Jesus said it this way, um, and what he says is greater than anything else that I could say or anybody else could say. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 14, If you forgive those who sin against you, your heavenly Father will forgive you. But, there's a big one there, if you refuse to forgive others, your Father will not forgive your sin. So my friends, if you've asked Jesus Christ to forgive you, you are free. But in your freedom, do not neglect proper maintenance because if you crash, you don't know how many others are going to follow with you. Think about your relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, today is the day. Today is the opportunity. Feel free to contact me. My number is on this page someplace. And so look me up. Call me. I want to talk to you. Message me. I want to talk to you because knowing Jesus and forgiving others is the greatest thing you can do for yourself and for them because I want you to be free. Christ wants you to be free. And with the freedom that you can experience from that, you can have a great life and enjoy it for what it's supposed to be. Blessings to you. My friends, this is Pastor Kevin Klaus, and I can't wait to see you again. And may the favor of God be upon you. Bye-bye.